you so much for inviting me here. Can everyone hear me okay? At the back, all all right? Okay. Um, I'm the founder of FIRE, Physicians Health Initiative for Radiation and Environment. And I sit on a number of international advisory boards for different groups. And I've been invited to speak to you today about the fifth generation of radio frequency tech that's currently being rolled out both here and abroad. I, I'll be honest, I've cut this talk down quite a lot. It, it started off really lengthy. And the reason I've done that is because I've noticed in a couple of other talks I've given that people have a huge number of questions. And I think they're frustrated when they don't get a chance to answer those questions. So I've deliberately kept it reasonably short and snappy so that I hope if you do have questions, we'll get time to um, cover those. I'm going to give a quick overview of non-ionizing radiation in general, an introduction to 5G, uh, a discussion about millimetre waves and its place and role in, in this discussion here in the UK. And then some ethical concepts which I think are really important. And then moving forward, hopefully, in an informed and healthy way. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum is quite vast. And I think all of you will be aware that ionising radiation up here with the very high frequencies is already known to cause cancer via ionisation, moving electrons out of their orbits. For many years, the non-ionising portion was considered relatively biologically inert, but that's not correct. All areas of the electromagnetic spectrum can affect health, and those effects can be very serious. And we're going to focus today on the radio frequency spectrum, which encompasses microwaves actually as well. It's the area that we use for all our mobile communication devices that are wireless. Um, now, one of the things that people have been saying to allay concerns about this is that you mustn't worry because radio frequency radiation has always been around us. It's been here since before the dawn of man. Now, that's really a gross generalisation. It's partially true, but it's not a very scientific approach. Because what we've created is actually, in terms of intensity, a billion, billion times higher than that. That's about a quintillion times higher than natural background radiation levels in this area. And in addition to that very high intensity change, we filled in an area, you can see in green here, where natural background levels dipped to around a gigahertz. And that, that's actually the portion that you can see through the years we have been filling in with anthropogenic or man-made electromagnetic fields for communication. A long time ago, back in 2011, the World Health Organization categorized all radio frequency, all of that that I just showed you, and that portion of the spectrum, as a group 2B possible human carcinogen. What they were saying there is we've got some evidence, and this evidence for this classification was based on higher rates of certain types of brain tumours in heavier mobile phone users. And the types of brain tumours in particular that were brought to attention was a, a brain tumour called glioblastoma multiforme, GBM tumour. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And another type of tumour also called uh, acoustic neuroma. It's a type of schwannoma. And if you can, I'd like you to remember that word. That means nerve sheath tumour. Now, one of the things that held this back from a higher category, so group 2A means a probable carcinogen, or a group 1 would mean a known human carcinogen, what held it back from that was lack of mechanistic data. We like to know all the steps. If A causes B, we like to know all the steps mechanistically by way that that happens. And also, supposed lack of animal data. Now, actually, some data in both of those areas was available in 2011, but not enough to satisfy the criteria. That data has evolved during that time, but IAC has not reconvened to reclassify this yet. It's been labelled high priority, and that means it should be addressed in the next two to four years, which unfortunately is potentially after the rollout of 5G. Now, I'm going back to the electromagnetic spectrum for a moment, and the reason I show you this is this is a bit more relevant to the 5G debate. So um, this is just showing you, in general terms, how wavelengths can correspond to give you a mental picture of what some of these wavelengths correspond to. Now, millimeter waves, which are quite high frequency, um, higher than generally has been used in the public forum in the past, correspond, they're millimeter waves, they correspond to the body size of, of a lot of insects. And some of the longer wavelengths that have been used historically for 4G and pre-existing um, technology corresponds often to the sort of dimensions of a human. And then as we go down in terms of higher wavelengths and um, 
lower frequencies we get things that are more akin to building. So those are the dimensions we're talking about. And to be clear, 5G is going to be using a lot of technology in the lower frequency bands that we've seen already with the rollout of previous technologies. And then there's propositions for higher frequency bands, and I'll say more about that later in the lecture. So some fast facts. Radio frequency radiation can damage biology at very low intensity or so-called non-thermal <coughs> exposures. There are no UK safety limits to protect biology against those low intensity non-thermal effects. What is presently being used as a safety standard is something called the ICNIRP guidelines. And these were devised back in the 90s to protect only against tissue heating effects. Nothing in terms of all the low frequency effects that affect, that affect biology below that point. Biological disruption is not linearly proportional to either intensity or frequency radiation. That's a fallacy. Um, so by just going of higher intensity through the radio wave spectrum doesn't equate necessarily to worse biological effect. There are some instances where it does, but it's not a linear phenomenon. And I'll say a bit more about that later as well. Um, and the same with intensity. So you wouldn't expect this, but sometimes we, we've shown in some biological studies that when you have a lower intensity, if you, for example, move the router away, that can actually have an enhanced biological effect under certain circumstances. So what I'm telling you with that information is this is difficult to predict. In terms of science, this is not a simple experiment where we can say, if you use this exposure, this is going to happen. It isn't like that. It's far more variable and unpredictable. So we've talked about these windows, frequency windows and intensity windows, but there's a whole load of other stuff that governs biological interaction to make it even more complicated. Polarization. So I have, I've noticed that um, I've, I've been asked to speak in the press a bit recently on, in the radio and uh, newspapers and things about this. And they always have the oppositional viewpoint, quite rightly. But what a lot of people are opposing this with is they're saying, don't worry about radio frequency radiation. It's just like sunlight. And I found this <laughs> scientifically incredible that people are willing to say that in, in a public domain. There are so many reasons why it's not the same. I mean, a GCSE physics student understands that sunlight doesn't pass through a wall, but a lot of radio frequency radiation does. So some of the differences are blindingly obvious, but some of them are subtler. And another one is polarization. Natural fields tend to be unpolarized, whereas man-made fields are polarized, and that can have a more serious effect on biology. And you can look to the work of Dimitris J. Panagopoulos to understand more about that. Cumulative exposure is really important, a bit like smoking. So um, a lot of experiments are done and the safety limits are set on very short-term exposures. Now, all of us have very cumulative exposures now because this is in every part of life 24 hours a day for most people. So cumulative exposures are massively important but have never been taken into account when safety limits were set. The type of signal, so um, information carrying waves <coughs> create a sort of sawtooth profile that's um, far more complex than the old-fashioned sine waves that were used at the evolution of radio technology, for example. That has a worse biological effect in certain circumstances. And then there's synergy. So um, we found that electromagnetic fields can interact with other toxins, for example, chemical toxins, where you get a sort of two and two makes five effect, and they are more of a, a toxic combination together than either one of them would have been apart. So laboratory experiments are difficult. That's one of the things I'm telling you here. We've, we've talked about synergy, but the other thing that happens in real life that often isn't taken into account in experiments is reflection and absorption within rooms. So in a room like this, or let's say in a classroom, because that's somewhere we, I'm seeing a lot of different devices emitting, some of these fields will reflect off something like a filing cabinet or a radiator, or there'll be multiple devices all emitting at the same time. Those fields can cross over and interfere, and technically they can produce something called constructive interference, where for a split moment in time, possibly, you'll get a much higher intensity, higher amplitude wave. That could be happening in the space in the room, or it could be happening inside your body. And these are impossible to predict because they're so quickly changing in time and space. Um, vulnerability, so all you guys are different, all our children are different, they're not like the routers that came off the production line, and all environmental exposures have a variability and sensitivity range. 
So some will be exquisitely sensitive and others will not. Some will have underlying comorbidity or health problems that diminish their reserve to repair damage. There's lots of different reasons why not each person will respond the way the person next to them does. Now, we've become a little bit mechanism obsessed in society. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I, I was very much um, brought into the culture in medicine of evidence base. It, it was essential to our practice. I used to work at the Royal United, actually, here in Bath, so it's nice to be back in this, in this area. Um, and this was very important to us all, and it should be. But what I suggest it shouldn't be used for is to delay appropriate advice to the public. So if we can show very credibly that A is causing B, if we don't yet have all of the information about every single step by, that unravels to show how that process works, that shouldn't stop us taking sensible measures to do what common sense tells us we should be doing. However, don't let that um, confuse you into thinking we don't have good mechanisms to explain some of what's happening here, because there are, and they're unfolding continuously in the scientific forum. And these are just some of them. So induction of reactive oxygen species, that's something called oxidative stress. And we know that causes ageing and degeneration of cells, which can lead to a lot of different systemic problems and endpoints. And I'll, I'll speak a bit more about that. Altered calcium handling, which I'll also explain in a bit more detail. Gene expression changes, DNA damage, both genetic and epigenetic, inhibition of DNA repair. Um, so there are probably multiple pathways by which this can cause biological change. And this is one of them. The reason I've chosen to mention this mechanism is because it's quite a simple one to understand, and it's very well documented in the literature now. Um, you can look at the work of Professor Martin Paul to understand this a little better. But what this is explaining is that these fields can open up something called voltage-gated calcium channels that sit in the cell membrane. It can gate them irregularly so that they open and they allow calcium to influx into a cell causing, setting up a, a cycle of something called nitrosative stress, a type of oxidative stress that produces these harmful re free radicals that contribute to things like cancer formation, ageing. And oxidative stress is linked with a whole load of different endpoints. It's a de degenerative process. But um, there are some more specific ones that I, I would say are linked with EMF. And what's disappointing is that many of these are things that are rising in the public health forum and moving into younger and younger ages. Um, in terms of the importance of oxidative stress, I think even if we find a good mechanism that makes sense, we, we have to then stand back and go, all right, how robust is this in terms of the literature? Now, the, the other reason I chose to talk to you a little bit about this one is because there have been a lot of reviews. This means um, overall looks at large quantities of peer-reviewed published papers that show that this is very strong in the literature. This is one that just happens to be published in The Lancet, um, Planetary Health, and this was showing that out of over 300 studies, about 89% of those, when they were looking for oxidative stress, did find that. And there are quite a lot more reviews than that. That's just one of them. Those have been happening for quite a long time. Um, now, I draw your attention to this. This is the, on the basis of, well, we have some good mechanisms, and we have quite literally thousands of papers that demonstrate low-intensity effects below our current safety limits. On the basis of that knowledge, scientists have, have gotten together. I keep being told, you know, but there's a big debate, there's no scientific consensus. I would say that's not entirely true. What there is, is there's independent scientists, and then there's industry-funded scientists, and I'm sure there are some that cross over in between. But this is a group of hundreds of scientists who've got together, who are experts in their field, and said, we call for lower safety limits that are actually based on the science, that are biologically protective. And that was quite some years ago. So you can imagine how that group felt when the reaction to that was to start rolling out 5G. That brings us on to talking a bit more specifically. Everything I've just discussed and covered, and far more because I cut out a huge number of slides, is about existing technology. It's explaining to you that what we have before 5G is not safe for biology. We have a whole load of different types of health effects that are now well proven in the literature. But, we like to run before we walk. And the point of 5G to connect us 
even from space and in every place. And to just briefly go through how this has evolved. So 1G, the first generation brought us mobile telephony and then messages with 2G, broad data and internet, 4G promised to be faster and it was 5G bigger, better, faster, more. And real-time interactions is a lot of what this is about, um, which would support automated vehicles, for example, and a much larger number of devices per unit area. Some of the differences, well, arguably frequency ranges. When I say arguably, as I say, quite a lot of the frequency ranges will be pre-existing with 4G. But there is... Um, a proposition for much higher frequency waves and some of those uh, bandwidths have been auctioned and some are proposed for auction. The higher frequency waves, um, so-called millimeter waves, some of them, there's obviously a sort of gradual change from one to the other, but those don't penetrate particularly well. And so this is the justification being given for a much higher density of antennas. But in addition to that, there's some different phase modulation. And I'm not an expert on that bit. But um, what I gather is that in order to help waves propagate, we're going to have some increased data burst spikes, so much higher intensity spikes. Now, I told you at the beginning that one of the things that's more hostile to biology is when you get these really sawtooth profiles. And that's one of the biological concerns about the proposed modulation for this. Um, so more in the public domain, essentially, and provision from space. These are some of the frequency bands that um, have been used, are being prepared, and are being proposed. And you can see they go up into the gigahertz um, area. Now, 30 to 300 gigahertz is what many define as millimeter waves, although it's variable in the physics community. And there's a hot debate going on right now about whether these are going to be used in the UK. Certainly, they're proposed abroad. Um, and I'm, I'm confused. So if anyone can shed light on this, I'll be grateful. But um, the head of EE has said categorically, millimeter waves specifically will not be used in the UK. However, um, there's another quote here from IEEE talking about the fact they're putting them forward this year at the World Telecommunications Conference. Now, one thing I would say is if they're not planning to use high frequencies, then there isn't a, a problem with propagation, in which case they don't need a higher antenna, t antenna distribution. But just going back for a second, um, one of the bands that um, you can see here is um, 6 gigahertz, and that one, from what I gather, um, is, is heavily being proposed in the UK. Now, what we... I'll come back to that because one of my papers talks about stuff that's in that frequency band. But one of the things that I think is not hard to appreciate is whether you call it millimeter wave or not, nothing kind of magical happens necessarily at that transition. Higher frequencies have similar properties in that um, they don't propagate so well, but they do allow this broader data transfer. Now, um, some specific papers that talk about some of these higher frequencies, there are quite a few, that, but there's... Um, not nearly as many papers as we have saying that the existing lower frequencies are damaging. So some of this is unknown, very uncharted territory in terms of biology. But this is a re I often like to start, when I'm doing literature searches, I start with the earliest literature. And often, they're some of the best papers. They're often done by the military. Um, and this was, a, this was declassified by the CIA. It was originally a Russian paper, so it's been translated. And it's uh, generally talking about health effects of non-ionizing radiation, but they do have a section on millimeter waves. Um, and they point out in this paper that morphological function and biochemical studies conducted in both humans and animals have revealed that millimeter waves can cause. And then there's a whole load of stuff that you don't need to be a scientist to say that doesn't sound good for biology. Structural alterations in the skin and internal organs qualitative and quantitative changes to blood and bone marrow, changes in reflex activity, tissue respiration, enzymes for respiration and metabolism. But this, I think, is a really important statement, and it reflects a lot of other literature on this subject, and it's of practical importance. The degree of unfavorable effect depended on the duration of radiation exposure and the individual characteristics of the organism. What that's telling you, that's talking to you about cumulative effects. And it's also talking to you about sensitivity levels. And those are the two things that none of our safety guidelines ever took into account for either existing technology or what is proposed. Now, obviously, at this particular point in time, where climate change is a big deal, we, I think we need to look beyond ourselves 
and and I'm really happy that actually that has happened globally is we have we are starting to properly look beyond uh, the consequences of our actions beyond just ourselves and obviously it's it's not a good time in history for us to do anything that would threaten pollinator populations. This, I think, is an important paper. This was published last year by Arno Thielens et al. and is talking about the exposure of some of the higher frequency waves on insects. You'll remember now the slide I showed you at the beginning, where I showed that um, certain wavelengths correspond to certain dimensions that are familiar to us all. Millimeter waves correspond to the size of insect bodies. And what this means is you can get a very much higher power absorption by something whose whole body corresponds to that length. And this paper is explaining to you that at, at around or just above 6 gigahertz, which is one of those frequency bands proposed here, you're getting this big increase in power absorption and an increase up to 3 to 370 percent for that insect body because these higher waves they're absorbed more on the surface because they don't penetrate well so anything with a high surface area to volume ratio is going to be prejudicially affected and particularly when its body corresponds to the wavelength and that can cause potentially dielectric heating changes which have been credibly linked to changes in behaviour, physiology and morphology. Moving back to humans for a moment, this is um, an older paper again by Professor Om Gandhi who's done a huge amount of work in this field, not just on higher frequencies but on many other areas of the RF spectrum. And I only bring this, uh, there is a lot of literature, I bring this to your attention because somebody said to me, well if it's that easily absorbed we don't have to worry because it won't go through our clothes. That's not technically correct. Um, firstly, your, your face is usually uncovered, and, and there's an issue with eyes that we're concerned about. They're on the surface of your body. About 90 to 95% of this, these higher frequency bands were expected to be absorbed in skin and in eyes. Um, but clothing doesn't prevent it. It can actually act as something called an impedance matching transformer. Doesn't matter what that means, but it means it can penetrate your clothes. And, continue the propagation to create quite high superficial, that stands for um, specific absorption rate. It's one of the ways that we measure dose, essentially. And what they're saying here is we can measure a high dose, even through clothes. Um, and, and concerned about eye damage. So he looked at the eyes of rabbits exposed to these frequencies and found that there were changes in the epithelia and the stroma component of the eye. They were reversible, but they were reversible with acute short-term exposures. We don't know what would happen with longer exposures. Other findings in the literature, and there's a lot of different things out there, but changes in antibiotic resistance in both directions, actually. And this is another, when I said these effects aren't linear, one of the ways in which um, some papers have misrepresented their data sets is they've averaged things out. So, for example, they might have noted in an animal study that there were increases in blood pressure in some of the animals and decreases in others, and they've averaged them all and gone, there is no change in blood pressure. And that's wrong scientifically because one of the things we know is that RF radiation can cause totally opposite effects because of different types of sensitivity, even within a species. And the same thing we're seeing here with antibiotics. It changes it, and you can't predict the way it's going to change it. Effects on the microbiome, which is really important. Your skin is your largest body organ. So skin effects are not insignificant. And the, your skin is colonized by a whole load of other organisms that don't belong to you, but they're actually essential to your physiology. And this can change the way that microbiome functions and is com the composition of it. Effects on sweat ducts, which are found to be arranged like helical antennas. Your DNA is arranged like a helical antenna also. And that's, why, that's one of the ways in which we cue in with very subtle electromagnetic fields in the environment to regulate our biorhythms, for example. But so is sweat glands, and they're showing that they're, they can be affected. Um, and lots of other effects. You can imagine that if signalling within skin is changed, that can have knock-on effects on many of your other body organ systems. Because your skin is often the first target for an environmental change, and it tells the rest of your physiology what to do. Now, I know I've gone quite heavy on a lot of the science there, and I, I also am aware that quite a few people in the audience don't have a medical or scientific background. And I would say there are other ways in which you can understand the evidence. You don't have to go out there and read all the papers. And one of them is, let, there's a lot of people who've done this for you, 
and are more independent than perhaps some of the advisory groups. And I would say insurance companies fit that bill. So insurance companies employ people to specifically, independent people, to specifically look at the literature and decide risk. And if they won't insure for something, I think that's really compelling evidence. And they have never insured, to my knowledge, for RF-related health effects. But those warnings against not insuring are certainly growing. That was Swiss Re document published this year. And this is, um, a, it, they've entitled it 5G off the leash. And um, I'm just going to read you a quote from one of their sections. To allow for a functional network coverage and increased capacity overall, more antennas will be needed, including acceptance of a higher level of electromagnetic radiation. In some jurisdictions, the rise of threshold values will require legal adaption. Existing concerns regarding potential negative health effects from EMFs are only likely to increase. An uptick in liability claims could be a potential long-term consequence, and they've labelled this as high impact, particularly beyond three years. Now, another misconception that you may have heard in the media is that you don't need to worry about mobile phones causing brain tumours. They don't, because if they did, we would be seeing rises in brain tumours. And there's several things wrong with, with that statement. So, firstly, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see rises yet. We know that it can take many decades from exposure to formation of cancer. But, despite that, actually we are seeing rises in the tumour types that are linked to mobile phone use. What's happened in some data sets is people have aver this averaging problem again. They've looked at all tumour types, some of which are dropping and probably not related to RF, and they've just averaged them all out. But when you look at certain tumour types, and I'll bring you back to the glioblastoma multiforme, this GBM tumour, which unfortunately is presently incurable. It has a five-year survival of almost zero. That is the type of brain tumour that, yes, is rising in the UK population. This is from the National Office of Statistics. Um, Alistair Phillips and Dennis Henshaw published this last year. And this, these rises are happening in young people as well as the older community. Now, in terms of moving forward, I think one of the most crucial elements to moving forward is accountability. We have to accept the science, the literature. We're an evidence-based community. That's how I was, I was taught to think, and yet actually we're denying the scientific evidence. So first we have to accept what the science is telling us. Then we need to introduce accountability because it's amazing how people actually read the science when they realise they might be accountable for what it's telling them. Now, it's been fascinating to myself and a lot of colleagues how 5G has suddenly opened up this debate in the public community because we've been saying for many years this technology is not safe and we need to reduce exposures. But I think awareness has been slowly growing and a line has been crossed there's been no informed public consultation. There's been no risk assessment. But there has been this massive scientific objection from really credible people. They're not conspiracy theorists. And it's not just the scientists who've objected. We've now got politicians who are starting to understand the science and taking a stand. People who, in many ways, you could say it's massively in their best interest to just go with it and let this happen. But they're not because they have an understanding and a conscience that says, actually, this is wrong. So the 5G appeal, I'm going to say a few words about this now. I've signed this document along with, as I say, hundreds of independent experts from all over the world. And what we say in this document is, present levels are already toxic. This is perhaps the most important message in this document. Harm to human and other biology is proven we're using strong language in here. That's a strong word in the scientific community. It takes a lot for us to say, A is causing B. But it, we feel that this is really well proven now. The, harm is ev the, the, the evidenced harm that is proven is below current safety limits, not above it. 5G will substantially increase exposures in general. And you don't need to argue about which frequency bands are being used and which aren't, or what, how it's being pulse modulated. Those are the finer points that, yes, we want to understand better with the literature, but not at the same time as experimenting with public health. And, and I don't really like the word experiment, if I'm honest, because if this were truly an experiment, we'd be conducting this in a totally different way, and it would be a, a far more humane approach. And I'll come on to that when we talk about ethics of this.
Some more key points from this appeal. The damages include cancer, we've discussed that, oxidative stress, we've discussed that, genetic damages, structural and functional changes to reproductive systems, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, ne negative impacts on general well-being. And that may sound a bit soft. I think years ago, mood disturbance would have been sort of brushed under the carpet, especially compared with something like a, a brain tumour. But no longer can we do that when we're living in a world where our 5 to 19-year-olds are dying of sadness like never before seen. Suicide is becoming one of the highest causes of death in our children. So mood disturbance that is credibly linked with these exposures in the literature cannot be ignored. It's a serious health effect. It's something that for some people becomes a terminal illness. And we're moving, as you can feel, into the ethical part of this debate now. Now, the other thing that's brought up, I'm so happy to see in this appeal, I've been talking about this code for many years when I lecture, and it's now been put forward, put out there for discussion. This Nuremberg Code was designed after the Second World War to stop inappropriate human experimentation. And these 10 points are enshrined in current <coughs> medical practice all over the world and in some international law. If this were exper an experiment properly designed, all these things would have to be taken into account. So you must all give consent. And it's not just that someone says, I'm going to give you faster video speeds. Is that OK? Yes, tick a box. That is not how informed consent works, not at all. In hospital, if I was to do that, that would be negligent and I would be struck off. So if we are trying to do something in a conscientious way, it needs to be a proper explanation of the state of science. Your risks versus benefit have to be correctly explained to you. The experiment should be designed to yield fruitful results. Now, actually, this could. You guys could have all had a blood test, you know, let's say with a zero RF radiation uh, background, you could have all had a whole load of blood tests looking for oxidative stress markers. As an example, there's a whole load of other stuff that would be nice to look at too. And then you introduce it, and then you do the blood again, and you see, and you see if there's been a change. And a whole, you know, so much more than that. But the problem is that's not been done. We do have fruitful results from existing technology, not because it was designed in, a, in an appropriate way experimentally, but because it's been happening and we have been paying attention. And there are public, published results like this rise in associated brain tumours. But this wasn't designed to give us the information we need to explain that, yes, this is definitely affecting health and these are all the different ways in which it's doing it. The experiment should be done on animals first. Now, I'm really glad we've got to this point because this is very important. This has been done on animals first. And again, I mean pre-existing technology and the lower frequencies that will be elevated with 5G. So I told you that the WHO classified this as a group 2B carcinogen in 2011. And one of the things that held it back was animal data. So they constructed animal data deliberately to, to be of relevance to human health. These were some of the most well-established and esteemed groups on the planet for looking at toxicity and carcinogenesis. The first one was the National Toxicology Program in the United States. Very expensive, very well-conducted study to look at, do we see those same cancers in animal populations when we expose them? Now, that was looking at mobile phone-type radiation, which is quite high intensity. That's what you are exposed to, high-intensity radiation, when you use a phone, especially if it's right to your head. So that is the way in which they designed the experiment, with quite high intensities. And actually, the same groups do toxicological studies on chemicals also. And you always go above and beyond what you expect the average person to get. Of course you do. You've got animals with much shorter lifespans and a much smaller number of them than in the public health domain for humans. So you go higher than that too. So they did that, and they published their findings last year, and they found glioma the same tumour types as we had already established in heavier cell phone humours. And with an even higher level of evidence, they found schwannoma. They found their schwannoma tumours in the hearts of these animals. Not a big surprise, because these rats weren't using their cell phones to their ear. They didn't get vestibular schwannoma. They got their schwannomas in their heart. And interestingly, those were highly malignant tumours. In humans, the vestibular um, acoustic neuroma is normally benign, but they can become malignant, and in this animal group they did. And then, for those of you, this again has been undermined in the press, these studies. And 
uh, they've said this tells us nothing about human health, which of course is ridiculous because this is how we've tested things for human health for many years. We weren't very interested in how often rats get brain tumours from using their mobile phones. The reason for this study was about human health. But they've also said the exposures were too high, the intensities were too high. But those same people cannot then explain away the next study that followed, which was the Ramazzini Institute study in Italy. Again, a very high methodology group. And what they found, which was was that low intensity exposures, mobile phone base station like exposures, also produced schwannomas in the hearts of their animals. They also found lioma, but with lower statistical significance. And one thing I should say is the NTP, they had a huge review panel, and after peer review, it was de designated as clear evidence of cancer. That's the highest possible category that they can give it. So we've done the animal studies, they corroborated the human epidemiological data, and then we pushed that under the carpet, somehow. No physical or mental suffering must be involved. Well, of course that is a problem. Many of you will have heard about people suffering with electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And this is a real condition. It's been shown in double-blinded provocation studies. There's also a whole load of studies that failed to show it. They were very poorly designed, and in science, again, you pay attention to the studies that, that demonstrated it and look at the validity of those. And this is a real condition that can certainly lead to substantial suffering, and it's doing that here and now for a not insignificant proportion of the population. But in addition to that, of course, people with incurable brain tumours are, are suffering. Of course they are. No risk of injury, disablement or death. Well, I mean, that's a ludicrous statement given what I've just explained to you. And in addition, I can tell you that because the medical evidence on EHS is actually very good, these people are getting recognition as disabled individuals in courts of law. This is both adults and children in this country. The degree of risk cannot be found to be greater the, than the importance of the problem. Well, many of us are not utterly convinced that there was a problem that we had to fix, that desperately needed a whole new revolution in technology. I, no one's debating that it's sexy and that there are a whole load of fantastic and interesting things that can be done, but at what cost? And when you look at the risk versus benefit of this, there is just no way right now, with our level of knowledge, that we had some massive problem that required this level of risk to fix it. Preparations will safeguard against injury or death. Well. I, I'm not aware of any preparation to safeguard biology from 5G, but the, the greatest level of preparation we had was pre-existing technology like your phone. Now, your phone, the preparation was that it was, it was tested on a mannequin before you used it, and he was called SAM, Standard Anthropomorphic Mannequin. He, had, he was the, the 90th centile of military recruits. This man was not representative of an average man, let alone a woman or a child. Now, that's very confusing, isn't it? Because the exposure levels that that size head will be allowed is much higher than is legitimate of an average person in society. So the preparation was highly dubious. But then in addition to that, the safety guidelines, we know that they're, not, they're only protecting against thermal effects, so those were also not appropriate. And on another level, even those appalling guidelines are not being upheld by current mobile phones. And when I say that, you can look up something called PhoneGate. Mark, Dr. Marco Rassi in Europe has shown that 9 out of 10 European smartphones are exceeding the safety guidelines. So industry are not being compliant with their woefully inadequate limits. Um, conducted by scientifically qualified people. I have no idea who's, whose brainchild this was and who's implementing it. Um, but this is where we come back to accountability. I think it, it is important that we know who that is, that we sh we're shown their science and their, their defence of their position. This is a really interesting one and highly relevant to many of the groups that are associated with you guys. The subject must have the right to stop the experiment. Well, people all over the country are trying to exercise that right. Now, I'm, I'm delighted that some of them are being successful in that. Long may that continue. Um, the people in charge must stop the experiment if they see untowards effects. But that's already happened, and nobody stopped it. They actually increased it by several orders of magnitude. So what we asked for, to bring you to the end of our appeal, what we asked for was please to halt the expansion of 5G. 
until independent, and that is the most important word in this paragraph, independent scientists can assure that 5G and the total radiation levels, because what we're talking about here isn't some one new thing. It's a whole load of layers of technology. The rest is not disappearing. We're just putting more on top. And that experiment, looking at the, all of the different layers of radiation exposure, that has never been assessed on any level. So we're asking that they do assess that and can show demonstrably in a credible scientific way that it's not harmful, especially for sensitive groups such as children. So I mentioned that people are exercising their right. I've been told that Trafford are doing this and have been successful, and now we hear that Freemar and groups all over the world, often very excellent cities, not Luddites, not technophobes, not conspiracy theorists, but really credible individuals all over the world are starting to wake up and say no to this. Is legal action possible, and who is accountable in that scenario? Um, th this is unrolling now. So the answer is yes, legal action is possible, and um, cases are being won all over the world and here in the UK. We actually, this is um, a legal group that are offering no win, no fee support for Wi Fi damage to individuals. And this is how we've seen this happen before, you know, in many different industries. And of course, most of you, I'm sure, will all know that um, brain tumours have found to be caused by mobile phones in courts of law quite a few times now. This is not one case, it's several. And um, there's legal action particularly progressing in Australia where they're using um, assault or threat to assault as one of the ways to move forward and claiming that they're being very successful in stopping thousands of 5G antennas via that legal route. In terms of the UK, I've already mentioned that we have EHS, the sensitivity being recognised as a disability. That stands for electromagnetic <coughs> hypersensitivity, just to remind you. And this is commonly headaches, dizziness, palpitations, mood disturbance, insomnia, tinnitus. It's a broad range of symptoms, which is exactly what we would expect because radiation affects lots of cell types in lots of systems. Medically, this makes perfect sense. We have a brain tumour case uh, progressing here in the UK and cases will continue to be won and escalate. Now, um, one, I, I was asked by many different groups if I had any kind of resources to help people understand 5G and uh, try to educate other people in their community. So I put together a leaflet um, which is downloadable from firemedical.org and you can print that out and use it. This has been endorsed, I, it was very carefully phrased to be scientifically really defensible in a court of law. And, um, this has been endorsed by a lot of different groups now, um, different groups of scientists and doctors, and you'll see the EMF call here, which is several hundred doctors have supported this leaflet. And I include on it a whole list of, um, of different websites that have independent information, lots of it. You'll be very overwhelmed by the amount of information you find if you really start to read about this subject. So I set this group up um, quite some years ago now because once I started understanding this subject myself, I had a huge number of people asking me for advice, both inside the medical community and outside of it. And I needed support and to grow the group to try to accommodate that. And um, we continuously need more support because actually the public are needing more. And so if you want to join this group and be part of a, I hope, progressive and healthy movement forward, these are some of the things on our agenda right now. We want a healthy progression forwards with a good dialogue between industry and uh, other groups and governments. That is what I'm looking for because in all fairness, industry were part of the problem. They are also hugely part of the solution. So we all need to work together to accept that there's a problem and then work out how to deal with it. And I would suggest it's a stepwise approach.